another guest. Am I like towering over you guys? Yeah, we're, me... we feel like tiny ants down here. I'd love to be a tiny ant one day. I'm trying to be tall. I'm just a sexy baby. Okay. I'll stop doing song references, how about that? Yeah, I think that'd be nice. <laughs> <laughs> Hello and welcome to another episode of Zelf on the Shelf. We are your hosts. Sam. And Tanner, and today we are joined by Stephanie. Guys, welcome. We're so glad you're back on the channel with us. And I'm so excited to be joined by Steph. I got to interview Steph for Mormon Stories a few months ago. And I was very impressed and I've wanted her to be on our channel ever since so that we can just kind of like mine her for our personal gain. Stephanie took mushrooms one time as a Mormon and then realized Mormonism was bullshit. Kind of crazy. Spoiler alert. <laughs> Spoiler alert, yeah. So I would love for you to Tell our audience about that. I'm interested how uh, active believing Mormon. I mean, I, I know some active believing Mormons who use mushrooms because it's like, you know, it's natural, yeah, yeah, yeah. all the reasons. It comes that from are, the earth. Yeah, exactly. But still kind of surprising because I feel like you were so orthodox. Yeah. Like, how did you get to the point where you were willing to do that? It took a while. It took like a year probably of like doing research and like listening to podcasts and watching documentaries. And I think like what hooked me was it was like not only like the science and like the studies that they were doing on psychedelics, but also that it was like this indigenous tradition, right? Mm. It was like a spiritual practice. And so I was like, I feel good about this, mm. <laughs> you know? I was like, I'm not gonna do these recreationally. I would never. I will not have Same. any fun <laughs> while I do not have fun. Not laugh nor giggle. No. Yeah. <laughs> I just want them to heal my brain is essentially what I was doing, you know? Mm -hmm. And I was like on an antidepressant at the time. And finally one day I was just like, screw it. Like I'm gonna get off my antidepressants and do this, which is really crazy for a Mormon. Bold as well to yeah. get off your antidepressants and just plunge yeah. in like that. How does yeah. a believing Mormon go about acquiring mushrooms? I know, right? <laughs> yeah, you need a drug dealer. Yeah. I was like, drug dealers in Utah? No. <laughs> yeah, I literally just Googled. I was like, <laughs> I was like, I don't know how to find this. I don't know how to find this. I was so orthodox. Like, that's not even a joke. You could, I mean, if you were to ask my ex-husband, he could, he has so many stories that he'd be like, you would not believe <laughs> what kind of a Mormon I was. It's embarrassing. So yeah, I think of course we I can relate. Yeah. I feel like we were in a similar sort of camp of, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like, was it OCD? It's yeah. so hard to know. <laughs> yeah. There's a fine line there. Yeah. Yeah. So I like Googled, I knew that there was such a thing as like a trip sitter, like a guide. Mm -hmm. So I was like trip sitters in Utah. Aww. And there were, I think there was just one that came up. There's like a couple websites that you can go to. I can't even, I don't know what they are now, but they have like lists of people who will like sit with you. And this woman came up and she's like a full on like medicine woman, this little like Mexican woman. And went down to her house. She was like saging me and she had like tarot cards and like crystals everywhere. Mm. And at the time I was like, what is this? You know? Yeah, were you like, this is giving Satan? Or? Yeah, yeah. Okay. I was really? like, I was like, dear <laughs> Lord, please forgive me <laughs> if I've sinned <laughs> for my depression being too bad. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so you had really exhausted your options then to get to this point. Like you'd been on antidepressants. You had the true gospel of Jesus Christ I did. and the spirit of the Holy Ghost and yeah. it still wasn't enough. I know. The, the, only, the only people who experienced true joy, yeah. you know, yeah. everyone else, Kind of suspicious is just that. what I'm saying. That's, yeah, <laughs> that's what I had been told, you know, and I did a lot of praying and I did a lot of scripture reading. I'd been on an antidepressant for probably seven years and I, I wouldn't say that I had more anxiety than depression. Um, but it was like to the point where it was like becoming unmanageable. Mm. We've all been there, guys. <laughs> no, it couldn't be me. Yeah. I am very good at managing my anxiety. Always, <laughs> always have been, always will be. What's anxiety yeah. Yeah. for those of us who are just hearing about this? I was kind of like a little bit desperate. Mm -hmm. And I'd heard such good things about it that I was like, okay. I mean, there's, I feel like there's the, the way that psychedelics are marketed has kind of done like a, a, a full 180. Like mm. back in the, in the, like the war on drugs. It was like, these are going to fry your brain and mm. scramble your chromosomes and all that. And now it swung the opposite way where they're like, these can fix all of your problems in your inside of your brain, mm -hmm. you know, which also is not accurate. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so I kind of went in with this, like, yeah, with that, like, expectation of, like, fix my brain, you know. I'm ready mm. to not be depressed or have anxiety ever again. Here we go. Oh, same girl. So daunted going into it. Yeah. 
And you did, had you known other Mormons who had done it or were you just no. flying blind? Wow. I, yeah. Wow. That's very brave. Guys, I don't know. It just, it was, it was wild. It was inspired. Yeah. And I had this feeling on the way down there. It was like, I feel like for some reason my life is never going to be the same. Mm. It's like this weird, like presence. It's like, what's oh, about to happen? I love a little foreboding thing like yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> like that would happen a lot with stuff. <laughs> wow. That's anyway. how I felt. As you were doing my bouffant the other day, <laughs> issue, I was like, something is going to be fundamentally shifted in me forever after this. <laughs> and it fun. has been. And it really genuinely has yeah. been. Tell us how the mushroom trip went. The mushroom trip Did was you very have any fun. Yeah, it was very like uneventful. She only gave me one gram, which is not a lot. And nothing really crazy happened. I was just kind of like very, I mean, you guys know, you get like very introspective and you're kind of like looking at things differently and you know you feel like your heart's really open and it's like I was seeing some visuals but not really a lot and I just sat there and talked to her the whole time about my problems or you know it was like I was in a therapy session on mushrooms is what it felt like you know something I imagine of myself in that situation is if I was a Mormon and then this spiritual guide is not Mormon did you feel any pressure to be a missionary so I feel like that was so drilled into me that I would have been like nervous to be honest about some stuff. Yeah. So she, she was actually, she loves Mormonism. Mm. She was an interesting mixture of things because mm. she spent a lot, a lot of time. Well, she was a convert when she was older and then she spent a lot of years in the church and she loved it. And then she found plant medicine and then she started to go down that route. And so she, even though she wasn't technically like active, she still like Loved a lot of things okay. about it. Yeah, and so it wasn't like a, you know what I mean? It felt safer to me, I guess, yeah, I was gonna at say. the time. Had you been, <clears throat> had you had any doubts or things that you're wrestling with church-wise Hell before? No. no it was like just zero. Like, wow. Just like your own mental health issues that yeah. the church obviously wasn't helping with, but you weren't like connecting that as necessarily. No. Hmm. No. Isn't that wild? I feel like that's why me, for me personally, leaving was so shocking because for myself, because it was like, there wasn't any kind of like, at any point in my life, never was I like, I don't know about this. Like, Mm -hmm. it just was like, it fit me like a glove. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's so rare for someone to just have one single experience, no doubts before. And then yeah, uh, for 180, I feel like even... I don't know. I feel like I had zero doubts before my faith crisis started. And then it was a few months. But that's still a few months of like yeah. being on that path and kind of yeah building up to the ultimate realization yes. as opposed to just one single day. I feel like anytime you hear of someone, once in a while you'll hear a story of someone who like reads a CES letter and is immediately like, I'm done. Mm-hmm. But they usually say that they'd kind of had a feeling all along that things weren't quite right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that's unusual. So you said it was uneventful. Yeah. And yet it yeah. created the most eventful yeah. shift of reality that could have possibly happened yeah yeah it's like shit started to hit the fan once I got home uh. and that's been every experience I've had with psychedelics has been like the experience itself is like cool or insightful or whatever and then it's the next couple of weeks or months after that that it's just like the integration yeah the... like so much is going on mm. so yeah I got home and then it was like so that was the end of January and then by the Middle of April, I had left the church or was like on my way out and gotten divorced. Whoa. Gotten divorced. And you weren't Whoa. thinking about divorce either. No. Before. And that's, yeah, yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah, it was, it was like just basically, I don't know. I mean, I don't, I feel like I don't need to describe it to you guys because I feel like you get it, but it's like. We've only taken legal Delta 9 gummies. <laughs> just, you keep saying. <laughs> I keep it okay. The yeah, episode we did legal. about our psychedelic experiences, our Mormon stories episode about that. <laughs> No, that that. was a bit. (laughs) (laughs) But it's like you, all of a sudden I was like seeing things, how they actually were. It was like this weird, Mm. the veil had been lifted Mm. and I was like, what is going on? And I remember it was right around general conference time, right? It's like in April. And I like turned it on and I was like listening to what they were saying. And I was like, is anybody else hearing this? (laughs) Like, can you guys see what they're like? Mm. I like couldn't unsee it. Mm. Which was what? What were you seeing that was so... I was seeing, like, how everything was masked as love. It was like they were saying all these things and they were making it sound loving. But really what they were saying was, you have to do this and this and this and this in order to, you know, be safe or be loved or whatever. Mm -hmm. It's like I could see all of that. And I was like, these guys are the bad guys. It's like the man behind the curtain all of a sudden. Right? The first general conference after the veil is lifted is yeah, harrowing. It yeah. is. Highest degree. And then you look at these old men and you're just like, 
oh my gosh. Mm, they're just guys. Yeah. They're just some guy, someone's grandpa. And they're kind of scary. <laughs> yeah, like, they know nothing. And they're like really creeping me out. Yeah. yeah. It was wild. Yeah. So if nothing alarming happened on the trip, what was like your first like veil lifting moment? Like what was your sort of first realization that was world shifting? I'm trying to think. And it was, was it like the next day? Or it like was that? like in the, for sure in the, the following, like I remember we got home and things started shifting immediately wow. and it felt like, like it felt very chaotic inside of me and it was like kind of alarming at first like I was kind of like what did I do to my brain like did Mm. I did I literally scramble my chromosomes you know (laughs) because like all these it was like it was happening so rapidly that it was like hard to like it was causing a lot of anxiety too right you know Mm. Um, but I'm trying to think of like the first, it was definitely a surrounding manipulation. It was definitely, Mm -hmm. I was recognizing the way that people were talking to me and, and like the way that church leaders or even like people in the ward, you know, like the way that they were talking and interacting, it felt very, it no longer felt loving. It all of a sudden felt like, oh, this is very, this is very manipulative. Like I can see, Mm -hmm. I can see what they're doing. It Mm -hmm. was like starting to pay attention to that if that makes sense Mm -hmm. yeah yeah that makes total sense yeah i i don't know exactly all the details of your trip but i feel like mushrooms is always you know oftentimes is such a deeply loving experience where you really are able to like be the lover and the beloved for your own self for the first time and like then in contrast anything that's not that Mm -hmm. is just so stark where you're like No, I've experienced real genuine love and that ain't it. Yeah, exactly. It's so true. And just like recognizing that that feeling came from me. And so I was like, okay, well, if all these feelings that I thought were coming from the church are actually just coming from me, then what is the church offering me? Mm. Like they're not offering me anything. Mm. All they're doing is pretending that they are and then adding a bunch of stipulations, you know, to keep me scared so that I stay dependent on them, Mm -hmm. you know? Did your Mormon conditioning kick in at all? Like in that period of chaos where you were starting to doubt Mormonism, did you have thoughts of like, oh, maybe this is Satan because I did mushrooms? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yes. And it was interesting, though, because I felt like there was this like knowing that I couldn't deny. I was Mm. like, I cannot see, unsee what I see now. But there was so many other parts of me that were freaking out. You know, Mm. they were just like, oh my gosh, you're not wearing your garments and you just said a swear word. And like all this stuff was just like, they were just, it was like chaos, right? Probably all my like younger inner children were like, what's going on? You know, and I'm like trying to calm them all down. So for sure. Yeah, it was, it was very chaotic. So on the surface, it kind of seems like a very typical, like Jack Wayland horror story of the perfect Mormon girl who did drugs once. Stephanie! And literally we Stephanie. Are Stephanie right now on Patreon. <laughs> Patreon.com slash self on the shelf. Wow, yeah. Where, you know, you do drugs and then all of a sudden you've lost your testimony you've lost yeah. and you walked away from your family or, you know, I don't yeah. know however they spin it. Not, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. A hundred percent. I'm sure that that's what, like, anybody who knew me as a Mormon, I'm sure that they're like, mm-hmm, <laughs> like, good, okay, you know. Uh-huh. She's fallen into the mist of darkness. Even though really, I mean, you're still, not that you have to be, but you're still very wholesome. You don't drink, you don't, Yeah. you're, you're very, con- you still have that same, like, what do you so even call wholesome. it? You know what I mean? Mm. That you, you really stick to a set of sort of safe values that I'm, you have. Yeah, I've been called wholesome before and I'm like, is that a compliment? Yeah, so. Is it? Yeah. I think that's okay. kind of what our whole generation aspires to. I want to be a And badass. I don't think wholesome means like uh, what sometimes people, like it doesn't mean that it's not you like don't chaste or pure, yeah, or holier yeah. than thou or righteous. Or like a or something. It's like yeah. earnestly open-hearted and loving, Warm. and like yeah. Okay, there's I, a, I there's accept. a different that definition. That sounds beautiful. I like Thank earnestness. Yeah. Yes, I love earnestness. Okay, so how did you unpack all of that? How did, and also, who did you go to for support as all of that was yeah. thrashing around in your mind? You know, it was a really difficult time because I know a lot of people when you leave Mormonism, it's like a huge it feels like a huge betrayal. And so I really had a hard time trusting anyone, Mm -hmm. you know? And it's like, I used to be really close to my parents. And then I was like, I can't like, what? Like you're still doing that whole church thing. Like I can't talk to you. And then, and then even new people that I would meet or like therapists or counselors or anybody, I'd be like, but 
how do you know that what you're saying is really the right thing? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so it was like a lot of isolation, a lot of like, you know, literally existential, uh, crisis quite literally where, you know, and, and like throwing the psychedelics in with all of the church stuff and the marriage, like all crumbling. I was literally like, what am I Mm -hmm. like? Is this, is this counter real? Like, Mm -hmm. you know, I'd be like, I just had, I had so many moments of like derealization. Um, so who did I turn to? I mean, it took me, I, I was like grasping at anyone that I could find, but it took me a solid, probably, I want to say six months to find like a good therapist that I was like, okay, this is somebody that I can really trust who can help me like through this process that I started meeting with weekly. Mm, that's good. Yeah. Cause I feel like people are quite vulnerable to, uh, other people controlling them when they're in that, yeah. uh, insecure period. Of yeah, time. absolutely. And that's why, that's why it took me such a long time to find someone because I felt like everyone I went to, I'd be like, you haven't done any inner work, you know, like you just, you're just, you know, like you went to school and you learned this thing and now yeah. you're like reading from a book yeah. Yeah. and I'm like, but you've got all these problems for yourself, you know? Mm-hmm. So this one, this one person that I started working with, he was very much like all about like connecting you back to what felt true to you rather like he never gave me advice. It was always like, let's get you back in your body, you know, and like get you back on the earth. And so it was like very helpful and it felt mm. a lot safer. Mm. That's the therapist you end up working with. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, cool. Yeah. Yeah. Talk about the body thing. Do you do you feel like psychedelics gave you a, a connection to your body you just hadn't had before? How were you <sighs> as a Mormon in terms of body, mind body? Yeah, that's an interesting question. So I feel like before I was completely numb to my body. Like mm-hmm. I I had always had like when you have a lot of anxiety or depression, I feel like you tend to have like health things with that, whether it's like like I had a lot of migraines. Or I would randomly get like, you know, body aches for no reason or, you know, just like weird things. I always felt like I was kind of sickly, but as far, you know, just a sickly person from so much anxiety. But like, as far as like being connected to my body, yeah, like I wasn't like, no, yeah, not at all. Like as a Mormon, I would never f- just feel a feeling as a physical sensation. Right. Like, people, <laughs> if I would have, if I heard people say things like that, it would just be like in one ear out the other. There would be yes. no ability. Yeah, if someone depression. said like, where's the feeling in your body? I'd be I'd like. I'd be like, yeah. who gives a shit, Dr. Craig? Let's get back to my outer obsession. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like you don't feel feelings in your body. It's funny <laughs> that you say that. Even if a therapist said it to me, I'd just be like, okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I feel like with me. It happened so rapidly. And this is like, people will call this like, you had a Kundalini awakening or you had a spiritual awakening. I've heard like all these like Mm -hmm. woo-woo terms for this, but it was like, I was numb to my body. And then like the next day I was all of a sudden feeling all these sensations. (laughs) And I I thought, I literally thought I was dying. I was like driving myself to the hospital. I'm like, what, this is doing a thing and I don't know what it is. And I was like, freaking out because I had never felt emotion as sensation. <laughs> and I remember saying to like a, like somebody I was working with and I'm like, this is going to sound so weird, but I can feel my emotions physically. <laughs> <laughs> and they were like, yeah, no, it is amazing how revolutionary uh, yeah. that is. Yeah. If you've never like made that connection. Yeah. I always get chills thinking about how many people are living their lives subconsciously with their main goal being running from the physical sensations of their emotions. Like, and everything is like geared around that. Yeah. So it makes sense to me that then when you suddenly feel them, you're like something really wrong is happening. Yes. Mm. Oh, it was terrifying. Like it felt like I, it was almost like I couldn't shut it off. Like all of a sudden I I had no feeling. And then all of a sudden I could feel everything. And it was like, I could feel it moving around in my body, you know? And I'm like, Oh my gosh. Just the enlightenment of my being blossoming like a rose. Yeah. (laughs) Very, very rapidly. (laughs) Were there any pleasant aspects to it? Cause I've, uh, I know people who have had similar experiences through like meditation or whatever. And you have the like colors being brighter and everything being like agonizingly beautiful. I feel like I'm getting there now. Okay. Finally, mm. after that was probably so that was probably two years ago when that happened, and now I'm getting to the point where I'm like, oh my gosh! And it's because I'm finally like cultivating that feeling of safety in my body, um, and so I can, you know, I can appreciate and like it. Like up to this point, it's just felt like overwhelm. Mm. It's just like it felt like I went from being a normal person, <laughs> normal. <laughs> to like a highly sensitive person. Mm. And all of a sudden I was looking at people who would like get overwhelmed in the grocery store and I'd be like, 
Yeah. I feel you, you know? Yeah. Or like, these lights are so bright. And I'd be like, I know, you yeah, know? Yeah, they are. <laughs> and before I was just like, what the hell's wrong with those people, you know? <laughs> My sister-in-law yesterday at Thanksgiving was like, can we turn on a light? It's so dark in here. And I was like, <laughs> like we could. We definitely could. <laughs> it's also um, just thinking about how, like in the contrast with Mormonism, how when you're taught that your body is like this, to treat your body like this enemy, like something to be afraid of and sensation normally, like if I allow myself to feel, it's going to lead me down this decadent path that's going to destroy me and my family and my life yes. and everything. And so we're, I think that's part of the like numbing out and disconnect from the body is because the body is evil and the body mm-hmm. is carnal and the body, mm-hmm. the body will s- sacrifice everything yeah. for itself. And yeah. so like learning to like, just love the soft animal of your own body. Yeah. yeah. It's a process because there's a lot that has to like reprogram and coming into that sensation can be like, I, I relate to that feeling yeah. of like, Whoa, everything is very intense. Now. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that that was going on for me unconsciously as well. It was like, before too, yeah. but I wasn't conscious of it. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And now and it gets channeled into like mental nonsense. Yes. Yeah. Which the anxiety realistically. Yeah, exactly. It was like all of, all of that. Yeah. was just like, I was just, you know, here all the time mm-hmm. to avoid everything that was going on in here. And then all of a sudden I started feeling everything that was going on in here. And I think my mental conditioning was like, oh no, you like you're in your body. This is bad, right? Mm -hmm. Like this is not safe. This is not safe. Like we have been programmed to be out of that. And so I was like this fight, right? Like I'm in my body and my brain's like trying to keep me out of my body. And it was just like, it was very chaotic. Yeah. And to be leaving a marriage at the same time yeah. and your whole support system is suddenly Yeah, coming. yeah. Like no, lost all my friends, just had like n- no one that I could like <clears> turn to. I'm, I'm like making this sound like very dark, but it actually really no, was. I mean, it's a dark. <laughs> they call it dark. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> There's no reason. Yeah. <laughs> it was very dark. The innermost yeah. cave or whatever. Yeah. It's nice to share that, I think, because there are other people that are going through it or will go through it. And it is, I mean, like, what a relief that you're here right now and that you're doing as well as you are, even yeah. though everything's always a journey. Yeah. Because well, isn't that the thing is you're like, oh, I am actually alone. And what the fuck is even real? Yeah. Like, <laughs> that is, that's exactly what it was. Yeah. And to hear, you know, that somebody can come go through that and be okay, I think is and we're all out. like trying to yeah. <laughs> reassure yeah. ourselves. Right? I know, right? <laughs> And it can sound like almost overly simplistic, you know, the idea that community is the thing that ultimately saves you. But it is so true. I was just thinking that Friendsgiving last night. Mm. Like, I was like, I feel so safe in this moment, hearing these different people express gratitude and just be like, you could just feel the love in the room. And I was like, this is a kind of safety that like you can't get from your own internal processing. Like as Mm. much as it's good to do, you know, self-work and and uh, I love meditation and all that. It's like you really can't put a price on the yeah. community co-regulation that we all need but don't really have. I think it <laughs> makes the, it, the process just way faster. Yeah. You know? Like I thought that so many times. I'm like if I had community right now, I feel like I would have like been way further along in mm-hmm. this healing process, you know, mm-hmm. than trying to do it all by myself. But when the trauma is related to losing community. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, where's my community? Like, I'm not going to, I like, I literally had none, you know, they were all, they were all Mormon. Mm-hmm. And, and even a lot of times people who leave Mormonism, like, I felt like I was going through an, a whole added layer of this like existential crisis too. Yeah. So it's not like I could just go to anybody and be like, mm-hmm. Are, are you real? Like, are yeah. we real? They'd How do we like, know what's real? Yeah. <laughs> like, they'd be like, what the hell? Mm. So it was very isolating. So it was like the, I imagine there were like different milestones along the way, but you said it was like maybe six months until you started to stabilize a bit and you yes. got the help of that therapist. What were kind of like the next big moments on that journey? You know, it's interesting because I feel like since then, there haven't been any big moments And I feel like I've thought about this a lot because I I think I had this perspective that like, and I think this came from Mormonism, honestly, that like there's going to be a thing that happens and then I'll feel better. Mm -hmm. Like there's going to be this, I don't know, some sort of external thing, right? That you're just like, then I'll feel good, you know? But like since then, it's just been a slow, steady process that I'm like, am I getting better? And then I look back and I'm like, oh yeah, I am. And then time goes on and I'm like, am I? And then I'm like, yeah, I am. And then you fall back and then you're like, oh yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And they always say that like the healing process is like a slow daily practice. And I'm like, oh, that's actually really true. 
Yeah. So, yeah, honestly, I mean, I just worked with him for a while. And then um, I was just trying out new types of any type of like healing, you know, like I got into like somatic therapies and I got really into Jungian psychology, as you guys know, that was very helpful for me. Um, Just changing my perspectives. I had to like reframe all my beliefs about myself, about the world. Um, So it was just, it's just been like a slow, steady process. Not to project my experience onto you, but I, I feel like psychedelics as well as just the whole process of, uh, untangling religious programming with my being and trying to like reorient myself toward the world. It gave me some compassion for, and I don't want to be like, I know exactly what it's like to have every type of diagnosis under the sun, but like for, you know, to be insane, to not have a grasp on what is real, Mm -hmm. to not have a grasp on what is safe, on what, like that is a really, really harrowing experience. And one that does take a lot of time to like, reground yourself mm-hmm. and to figure out how to even trust the process of learning mm-hmm. and trusting and mm-hmm. yeah and that line is so thin like the <laughs> yeah. line between like I'm mentally stable and then I'm in psychosis yes it's like, it's like <laughs> this thin yeah. you know yeah and people like I used to think that I just I was like I had it together you know at least for the most part but mm-hmm. you know it's not like I was like I had anxiety but I felt like I was mentally sane you know mm-hmm. and then all of a sudden I'm like oh no like that, that line is razor thin, mm-hmm. but I agree with you. It's like I, everybody I look at now, I'm like, there's no way you could look at any, literally any person in the world and be like, that's not me. Thank goodness. That's not me. Because like, it could be used so easily, yep. Yep. so mm-hmm. easily. Yes. <laughs> when you were talking about how it is just kind of like a daily practice, was it you shared the meme today that was like, Joy's only ever accessed in the present moment and it's not it's not through waiting for this big shift it's like literally finding it in a cup of coffee and mm-hmm. seeing the way that the sun mm-hmm. glint, glints against your favorite tree it's literally that simple and uh, thanks to psychedelics and other practices meditation of course really helpful a lot of those somatic things mm-hmm. getting into your body and getting to the place where you can I think, like, returning to that, like, witness stance, recognizing that there's a place, like, inside of my body that is always accessible, that is, like, a true refuge, like the Tara Brock book, that's, like, even when I'm in pain, there is a place where I can just view that pain Mm -hmm. and view myself in that Mm -hmm. and, like, hold compassion for myself and my experience in that. And... Oh God, such a difference, but you have yeah. to like go through all that crazy stuff mm-hmm. beforehand to even figure out why that's important. Yeah. And Mormonism conditions you to not find that place, Yeah, you know? And so then when you're, when you're thrown into the midst of darkness, literally you have no inner refuge. Yes. And I remember yeah. like working with somebody who was like, she said, safety is a cultivated inner state. Mm. And I was like, what? Mm-hmm. And I had never heard that. And I was like, how do you cultivate safety inside when nothing outside feels safe? Like the concept felt so foreign to me. And now that I've been able to find that, I'm like, oh my gosh, this is priceless. Like no Mm -hmm. wonder religions like take this from you. Mm -hmm. Because once you have that, you're like, okay, I don't really need, I don't need any of that. Yeah. It seems like so much of the spiritual path we all kind of have gone on or that resonates with us is like relinquishing the illusion of control. You seem like someone that was very controlled and contained as a Mormon to that, you know, to an extreme degree, even Mm -hmm. how did that unfold and how, how do you feel like you've, where are you at with like being able to not feel the need to control everything all the time? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it completely redefines what it means to trust or to have faith as they would say in the church. Cause really in the church, they're like, have faith. That basically, basically just means like, be obedient to this thing, this, these things that you don't understand and that make no sense to you. Mm-hmm. Like that's faith, but real, real faith or trust is like being able to literally have no clue where you're headed or what's coming or what's going to happen. You don't have anything to grasp onto and you still have that anchor. Right. And so then you're okay to let go of control of all those things. Mm-hmm. Which it was like that once again, that was the idea was so foreign to me. Mm. I'm like, people can't do that. You can't, you can't feel safe when you don't have control, you know? And I'm finally getting to that place. And it's like, it's like a different type of safety. 
Mm-hmm. It's a different type of safety than what Mormonism or any religion or any external thing can offer you. Mm-hmm. How did you find that place of safety in yourself? Yeah. You and know. how do you access it when times are down? <laughs> <laughs> Asking for a friend. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, it's been like a lot of things, a lot of things. I mean, there's just so much conditioning that like needs to be like rewired I feel like in your brain and I did a lot of IFS therapy which I really I really love liked. IFS yeah. so much. which one is IFS internal family one? systems oh. like yeah. no bad parts yeah yeah, yeah. Right. so that was super super helpful in helping me like just connect to the parts of me that didn't feel safe and see what are they saying what beliefs are they holding that are that are like false beliefs essentially like what parts of me are have been conditioned to think that I'm I can't be safe in here mm. so connecting to those parts and like hearing what they had to say and being like oh my gosh like this part is still holding on to this thing and then like bringing awareness to those and they can kind of like unblend from there um and then just meditating honestly do you guys know is it Rupert Spira is that how you say his name Sp- Spira I don't know he's like this British dude I love his meditations so incredible. He has these guided meditations that help you like essentially access that point where it's like you can become that, that just like clean slate of like awareness that has no boundaries and then witness whatever is happening in your life or Mm. internally. So I would say it's just, I mean, I wish it was like a more glamorous answer, right? But it's like, it really is a practice. Like they call it a spiritual mm-hmm. practice for a reason mm-hmm. because it's like you have to do it. At least me, I have to do it every day. I mm-hmm. have to put in the work. Otherwise, like it's not going to happen, you mm-hmm. know? And prevention is a lot easier than cure. Yeah, right. <laughs> and it's so easy to procrastinate and then you're already in crisis and then yeah. Yeah. So you're in I a- prefer to wait till I'm overwhelmed <laughs> by the storm till I, you know, yeah. remember the need to become the eye of the storm. I'm being <laughs> up in the hurricane yeah. and then I'll stop. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Okay, another question I have for you is because you were the perfect Mormon, so to speak. What was your, given that, given that it seems like you didn't, did the right things and you were confident in the fact that you did the right things, what was your relationship with shame like? And has that been a big thing you've yeah. had to unpack? Oh my gosh, you know what's so weird about shame is mine was so buried. It took me probably a year and a half to even access it. Like mm. I remember even telling my therapist, I was like, I don't have, like, I don't got a lot of shame. You know, I'm like, my thing is fear. Like, I'm just scared of everything. I'm afraid all the time, but there's no shame in there. And then it took me that long to realize that underneath that fear was shame because essentially the church is, it's, it's like conditional love, right? And so when you're taught conditional love as a child, what could be more terrifying, right? Mm -hmm. Like you're going to lose love if you don't do these things. And so it was like manifesting as fear But underneath it was this shame of like, I Mm. am only loved under these certain conditions, Mm. you know? And so like working with shame for me, it's been really hard to see. It's been really hard to see. And I think anybody who like says that they don't have some type of internalized shame, I'm like... Yeah. In this world? Yeah. Where did you grow up? Yeah. It's like the most universal thing I feel Mm. like. So yeah, there's definitely been a lot of that that I've had to work through. And, it's, mm. and still am, you know, mm. it's like, I feel like I am like, you know, some new thing will come up and I'm like, oh, I still have religious conditioning around this aspect of life or of myself or whatever that's making me feel bad about. I mean, getting divorced is a huge one. Mm. Like I'm still like, f- just like this guilt of like, what have you done to your children? And like, mm. you did this to them and blah, 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 blah. And like a family unit needs to be a family unit. Just all that. Like I'm still working through that. Cause that just runs so deep. Yeah. What were your shifts in your ideology around relationships that like allowed you to get divorced? You know, you know, I think I had just never, honestly, like I had never chosen myself ever. Mm -hmm. And it was like this, this very deeply unconscious thing that was like, you know, you, you got to get married. You got to have children. You got to be a mom. And and like deep down there was this like pissed part of me that was like, I don't want any of that. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You know what I mean? And so it was like coming out because it was so unconscious. It was like coming out in these weird sideways ways in my life, you know? Mm -hmm. And, but then once I like chose to get divorced, it felt like the first time I like chose myself. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah, Yeah. Yeah. And 
Did that answer your question? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah, really. I don't even, you asked me like how my ideals around relationship change. Yeah. Yeah. And so it was kind of like recognizing that like, like you ever heard of, what are they called? The myth of the magical other. Um, mm. Who talks about this? It's essentially. Is that just like someone else can complete you? Yeah. 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 Okay. yeah. And there's this, there's a young young guy who talks about, it. I can't remember who it is. There's like this whole thing you can watch about it, but it's essentially, yeah. Like that someone else can complete you and that you have to be in partnership. Mm-hmm. Like that's how you're designed is to be with someone else. And it was like all of that started to shift for me. And it's obviously like you were saying, community and like relationship and connection and all of that is so important and so healthy, but it's different when you like, it it felt more codependent for me, right? Mm -hmm. Like it just felt like I, I, like I don't have a function if I don't have a partner. I don't, Mm -hmm. if I, if I don't have that, like what is my point, Mm -hmm. you know? It's all like very role based. Yeah, exactly. Very role based. Yeah. As you are a parent and we are not, I'm always curious to hear like how how this journey has affected your thoughts on parenting. Do you parent differently now? I imagine you do, but oh my gosh, like I feel like I've learned so much just through young young in psychology alone about the psyche and how everything like you have your shadow, right? (laughs) Like it's basically like if there's no shame, this is my own, this is my own gospel, gospel according to me. Mm -hmm. If there's no shame, there is no shadow because without Mm -hmm. shame, we wouldn't, we wouldn't repress things. We wouldn't push things down. Mm -hmm. And so my number one goal with my children is like no shame in anything. Like Mm -hmm. they can come to me with like the most like, like something that would normally induce like panic in me or make me be like, Oh my gosh, like, you know, and it's just like, now I feel a lot more equipped to handle whatever it is that they're going through because it doesn't scare me anymore. Mm -hmm. It doesn't feel like, Oh my gosh, they have to be this certain way and they have to grow up to be respectable adults of society. And I got to make sure this and that it's just like, they are evolving. And as long as I am a safe container for that, then they will feel safe to be with me and it's going to come out however it's going to come out. You know, it's, Mm. it's, it is what it is. Mm -hmm. I do think a lot of parents parent from fear and are very scared of like even minor deviations from like their idea of how their child should turn out. Yes. And like having been a kid, like you just internalize all of that. Like that's what makes us so anxious as adults. And yeah. 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 And I think too, now I have, I have way like my perspective of like what is wrong is way smaller, Mm -hmm. right? Like I feel like you can be so many vast different things and still be an amazing human being. So I'm, I feel way less of a need to control because I'm like, I don't care where you end up or where you go. Just like, don't hurt yourself. Don't hurt the earth and don't hurt people. And other than that, it's like, you can do whatever you want. Yeah. You know, I've been, it's like been a continuing topic on my mind about how so much of our problem, like you said, no shadow without shame. Is that, did I get the right? Yeah. Uh, How much just being honest and open about our internal, our internal world (laughs) diffuses so many things. And it's so easy to see those of us who, you know, are raised in high demand groups or whatever, how that manipulation and shame is passed intergenerationally and it's just kept squashed. Mm -hmm. And that I really appreciated how you mentioned the like feeling that like kind of resistance to it or, but like having to keep even that, like being ashamed of being like, uh, you know, you don't want to be the rebellious or yeah. ungrateful or whatever, yeah. but there's like a part of you that's like, I don't want to do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I like, you know, we've all felt that at various stages and God, women in the church get it yeah. the worst. Certainly felt that as a missionary of just like, this is, I would, I don't want to, I do not want to do this. And I feel yeah. like I'm being forced to. Yeah. And just being able to like say, Hey, like, when we were first having doubts, we weren't even allowed to say, I'm having no. doubts because it was so taboo. Yeah. And it was, and oh, that culture is so You could tell your have. closest friends, the people that know your heart better than anyone, and they and who are believing women when you're having doubts and they're like, mm, you're like, do, you're doing something wrong. Like yeah. You're reading the wrong things or like, this is a you problem. Mm, it always has to be couched so perfectly. Of like, oh, obviously I know it's true. And there's just, you know, some things I'm trying to like bring your own tinker with. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like one of the most helpful 
types of like work that I've done in the last couple of years has just been unshaming. Mm -hmm. And that same Mm -hmm. therapist that would do IFS would also was very, very skilled in unshaming. Um, And it just made me realize how like literally everything is driven by shame. Yeah. And so now like with my kids, I'm like... They, and they've even said to me before, like they, they'll like be nervous to tell me things and then they'll tell me and then later they'll come to me and they'll be like, you just made me feel like it's okay to be myself. Like that you make me feel like it's not weird to be me, you know? And I'm mm. like, that's like my number one goal. Like imagine if we could all do that. Just be like, hey, I had this really weird thought about this thing that I was mm. thinking about and it was really strange and everybody's just like, that's cool. You yeah. Know? And it's like not a big deal. That's you know? where you got to find good people that yeah. can create that space because it does make a big difference. Someone said that at Friendsgiving last night. I was like, we're all a bunch of weirdos in our own ways. Like, no two people here are, mm. like, totally alike. There's not, like, one style or one, you know, type of person. And yet everyone is just so comfortable in their mm. own skin and with each other being their own people and so mm-hmm. supportive of those differences. Um, rather than being like, everyone needs to conform and be the same thing and wear the same shirt and wear the, you know. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. I liked what Joe said at uh, Joe Maddock, who we did a video with, uh, what he said about how there's like a thread that run, ran through everyone who was mm. there last night of just like commitment to trying to be conscious and open hearted and open minded. Yeah. Wholesome. Yeah. yeah. And that's like, that feels like true safety amongst people. Whereas yeah. Mormonism, it's like safety and sameness. Yeah. You know? Like we're all the yeah. same, so we're safe. And then, but when you can find people who are just like, no, we can be safe here because we love mm-hmm. each other really, not based on anything, then that's mm-hmm. like true safety. And it is like a problem in the world generally. It's like high control groups just take it to the extreme, like the need for sameness. But like every kind of culture has its own like level of required sameness where like if you fall outside of it, you get judged. Yeah. yeah and definitely like outside of Mormonism, shame is such a huge motivator. I mean, it's at the basis of like, class shame and racial uh, yeah. prejudice like mm-hmm. why were poor whites in the civil war era it was their shame at being a poor white person mm-hmm. that was stoked to make them be like well at least you're better than a black person mm-hmm. and that's why you need to fight for us so that we can keep that you know mm-hmm. it's like yeah. even that alone is like just religiously in general it's very easy for us to feel like we don't belong like we're in danger like uh, we ought to have more and we don't and mm-hmm. especially in American capitalistic culture where we're like, you know, chasing the grind and needing to acquire more and more things so to be symbols of our status uh, because if not, then that's a source of shame and if you just let go of all of that, then it is like a really, and maybe the only most, or the most radical Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. way is that? Yeah, no, I know Yeah. you know? Yeah, yeah because if you're untangling the shame in yourself, then you're going to not allow the access to the sh- big systems that yeah. are built mm-hmm. to perpetuate mm-hmm. shame. Absolutely, yeah. And it gives permis- permission to people around you to do the same. If they're also feeling, like, if they can feel that in you, it's like, oh, this person is, like, comfortable being who they are, so maybe I can also be that way. It's like totally. we're all a part of this mm-hmm. this yeah. weird game that's been perpetuated for generations and generations. The game. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And they have shown in research that, like, however low down you are on, like, the status caste system, people are just always inclined to feel superiority over anyone that's one level lower. Like, the poor whites being a great example. It's like, instead of feeling that class solidarity, you're like, we are all, we are so low down together, there's, like, just that desire to still feel superior to someone. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Seems to be, like, evolutionarily wired yeah. into us, which is a bit of a bummer. It is. <laughs> but, yeah. Yeah, well, de-shaming work. For so long, our, our morality has been based on, like, in-group acceptance, like you were yeah. talking about, kind mm-hmm. of herd morality yeah. versus mm-hmm. genuine morality. Which has never yeah. really been real, yeah. yeah. It's just, I know, right? It's just different groups of different flavors of status games. Yeah. Yeah. And even now, among, like, people we would consider the most virtuous, there's still, like, status games being played within that. Yeah, you can't still... not. It's just part of... Yeah. Being a homo sapiens, know, it's right? monkey culture, it y'all. Really <laughs> Here we are. It really and is. I think, like, when the unshaming everything, like, I, th- I think sometimes people have a resistance to unshaming everything because they're like, oh, but you can hurt people or some things should be shamed. I think you can, like, feel, uh, like, you can feel bad about having caused suffering, but it's not necessarily shame. I feel like shame yes. is the story that's like, there's something fundamentally wrong with you that makes you, like, not worthy of love or safety or any of those things. It's, like, different than remorse. Yeah, yeah. it is different than remorse. I think, too, there's this fear that, like, 
if we didn't have shame, we wouldn't feel like we wouldn't feel remorse, right? Mm. Like people are like, well, we, people have to feel shame for doing bad things. Otherwise everybody would just be doing bad things. And I'm like, I don't know about that. Yeah, (laughs) I disagree with that. Also when you're stuck in shame, I feel like you're so focused on like, how can I get myself out of this? How can I like feel accepted? And that's not really like a compassionate place to be coming from as opposed to like, uh, I feel like the less shame I feel within myself, the more I can feel genuine compassion when I do hurt people. That's not just through the lens of like me, 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 me. How do I like fix this for myself and my reputation? And you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that you have to, and I feel like part of unshaming work is, as we've been saying, like doing away with the the idea that like I'm a good person and like just getting rid of that binary altogether. Yeah, I couldn't I couldn't have hurt you. I'm a good person. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That thing of recognizing that anything you see in anyone is also in you. Like yes. any, anything a human can contain, you might be able to contain you, and you have no idea what could come out in you under certain circumstances. Uh-huh. Yeah. But it does seem like uh, well, shame is is always gonna like block your ability to like see it clearly which mm-hmm. is always usually just going to make everything worse and yeah. cause you to project that shadow on yeah other people. create yeah. more dysfunction and yeah exactly yeah that's why i love like the idea of everyone being fundamentally the same mm-hmm. like they really stress that and i'm sorry i keep talking about Jungian psychology guys. i'm, I'm not sorry, sorry. Okay. <laughs> that's, how, that's how my brain works now yeah, that's why we brought you here yeah <laughs> but they they stress that so much like with the idea of the collective right like the collective unconscious and stuff it's like whatever you see in someone else you are also that like mm-hmm. there is no oh my gosh i am this thing and that person is that thing it's like y- you've got the same underneath core collective like you are just as capable of evil mm-hmm. as whoever you know the murderer or whatever's happening and if your conditioning lends itself to you being more virtuous more easily that's a privilege that yeah. you have that your iteration of exactly. genetics and life experiences has made it so that you are not inclined to do things that cuz when you're someone who is abusive or oppressive like you feel the suffering of that too like you mm-hmm. don't just get to like reap the rewards and have a good time yeah exactly like, it's not fun to be an oppressor an abuser anything yeah. like that yeah Donald Trump's interior world doesn't feel like nope. a Zen garden. <laughs> no, he's not loving it. He hated being the president. Uh. So between then and now, looking back, um, obviously we've talked about some big things, but just like in contrast, what are some, looking back between then and now, what are some of the big differences? Obviously like... Then when I was Mormon? Family belief, but yeah. Is there like any other things that stand out? Or like your day-to-day experience of life even. I feel like there's way less importance. Well, okay, this is interesting because it's like the balance between like nothing matters, meaning everything matters, Mm -hmm. right? And so it's like before it felt like there was this hierarchy of like things that mattered and things that didn't. So it was like, okay, I got to do A, B, C, and D in order to be a good person or a good mom. Got to make sure I have this dinner made. I got to make sure I'm doing this with my friends, whatever. And then if you're not doing those things, you fall down on your your level of like self-esteem or whatever. And so I feel way less of that and way more like there is no hierarchy. Like literally you could do nothing and your life is like beautifully meaningful, you know? And so it's like everything is at the same time less meaningful, but also more meaningful. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Because it's like once everything has the same amount of meaning, it's just all Mm -hmm. meaningful. Yeah. And then it's when you have that hierarchy of meaning, let's say you're behind on some of your higher up things, you don't, you, the present moment is even further away from you. It's more obscured because you don't like give yourself permission to just like lean into the experience of peeling the potatoes to use like the Zen thing. Uh, but yeah, it's like it things like the, the small things really are the great things. There's, uh, this woman I follow on Instagram who's a poet called Chelsea Nelson. And she wrote in a poem this week, what was it like nothing is small anymore. I think she may have said it better than that, but that was kind of the theme of the whole poem. And I'm like, that's so true. Yeah. But it's so easy when you've been conditioned to need these like big storylines, big stakes, big everything. Or a checklist to prove that you are good and worthy. Yeah. And- <laughs> it's like, there's no, uh, yeah, you're, you're not drawn to the present moment at all. Cause it just feels pointless. Yeah, exactly. And then it's like the, 
the magic you could experience, like, you know, walking on the autumn leaves or something like that, is, yeah. is you don't get to have it. You don't get to enjoy it. Yes. And I feel, too, like my ability to feel is so much deeper now. Mm. You know, like before, the the happiness that you feel, at least for me, in Mormonism, it like, like I loved it when I was there. I was like, this is so great because you feel safe, you have community, and you're feeling the spirit, whatever, which is essentially just love. And I loved it, but it was so one-dimensional. And so now, like, I feel like I have full access to, like, my heart. And, like, it's almost like I'm a human now, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah, no, I feel, yeah. <laughs> I feel like I feel like Barbie, right? <laughs> right? Where she goes into the, you know, and which we watched that the other day. And my, one of my daughters cried at that part when she's about to go into become a human mm. and they're showing all those images of the do we like we like you yeah like, yeah okay yeah. of course okay. <laughs> all the images of like what it means to be human and she's like crying mm. and i'm like that's how i feel now where it's like mm-hmm. before you're just kind of like this robot that feels good right like i'm like i feel good because things are nice and in this nice little box but you're not really fully immersed in the mm. human experience and so yeah now i feel like I just like will cry at anything, yeah. you know. I'm just like, oh, this one small thing is so beautiful. I can't handle it, you know. Mm-hmm. And as much as you say you feel you felt good before, you also had crippling anxiety and depression, right? So exactly. It's a yeah. 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 Anyway, yeah. You know. It was like, yeah, it's like you feel good when you're smoking a cigarette when you're a smoker. Like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. You have that addiction. Yeah, very true. I'm trying to think. If there's anything else that's like vastly different? I mean, basically everything. Yeah. You know. I mean. Yeah. I can't, there's like few things that feel even like remotely the same, just the way that I view the entire world or like relationships or why, why I'm here or what I even am. Like it's all just completely different, you know? Mm. Thinking about what you were just saying about how you feel everything more. I feel like a big kick I've been on this whole year is like, I think so many of us just try and run away from what's hard. Um, and we don't realize how much we're also running away from what's beautiful at the same time. Like mm-hmm. it really is true. The Khalil Gilbrun thing of like mm-hmm. the deeper that sorrow carves into your being, the greater your joy is or the more joy you can contain. That seems to be really true. Yeah, totally. Yeah. I feel like a huge thing for me is developing the ability to really grieve, mm-hmm. which I did not ever do. Yeah. Yeah. I, if I did grieve, it was like a sporadic thing versus like, like a, a deep version. yeah 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 or allowing myself to really open up to the pain and suffering in the world and to witness that too and also to learning how to let like let that into my body and also let it out yeah. <laughs> uh-huh, yeah. and like you said that is that used to be a scary thing I didn't want to see it because I'm just a Mormon and I'm doing my thing and it's all in God's hands so you yeah. can take care of it I don't really have to worry about <laughs> anybody else <laughs> <laughs> But now just to really like be with it and, um, and also learning how to take care of those feelings in my body. Yeah. Um, we talk a lot with, about politics and stuff and there's a lot of, you know, we have to like learn how to argue better and stuff. And it's like true. I mean, most of us don't know how to regulate our nervous systems. There's not like a public education campaign here in the United States Mm -hmm. to teach people how to regulate their emotions or understand their bodies or anything like that. In fact, they're saying that like mindfulness is like an evil liberal uh, Which makes sense for authoritarians because if people who want power aren't able to co-opt your nervous system, their whole strategy is down the toilet. Yeah. Right. Mm. Yeah. I, I remember during that time too, when I was like really, really struggling just right after leaving the church and the mushroom thing and everything, another, that was another thing that hit me like a ton of bricks was all of a sudden it felt like I was in the world. Mm. And I was like, there were several days where I would just like, I couldn't stop crying. And I, it was so overwhelming for me because it was like all of a sudden everything mattered. I'm like, we're killing the earth. Mm. Whereas before (laughs) I was just like, you know, Jesus is going to come and like whatever. And then it was just like, there's wars happening and like children are starving and like there's Mm -hmm. homeless people. And I was like, oh my gosh, like we are responsible for this just because it's like, like it feels, it felt like it was all of a sudden happening to me. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm like, I'm a part of this. Like I'm not in this, in this like thing, like I thought I was, Mm -hmm. you know? And so it gets like, at first it was so overwhelming. Like I was like, I cannot like, I didn't know how to let that in mm. without it just completely 
crushing me, right, you know? Right. Because you're just so used to like doing that, you know? <laughs> like Jesus will. Oh, I'll cry a saying. little bit because I know that Jesus is going to make up for that. <laughs> yeah, like, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Are you a journaler? Am I a journaler? Yes. Oh, yeah. I write all the time. Me too. Yeah. I feel like words are like the language of my soul, you know, a lot of times I, and even the things that I like share on Instagram, like, I feel like if I put it out there and someone else is like, oh, you articulated a thing that I was feeling. I'm just like, my work is done. Mm -hmm. Stephanie is so good at that. And if you don't already follow her ex-woman deconstruction page, you really should. I wish I was better at like poetry. That's like when you read a good poem that just Mm. gets you, I'm like, Mm. Yeah. I could die. I'm always thinking I need to do more poetry. Yeah. <laughs> that is a fun go-to when feelings are really intense. Poetry can do something that regular writing about it can't. Yes, I, think. I mm-hmm. agree with that. Mm-hmm. Yes, I don't, and it's like it feels like magic to me. Mm-hmm. Like gets me in a, in a way that like yeah, sometimes regular writing doesn't. You know, oh, it mean? literally is. It, yeah, it uh, alchemizes or transmutes yeah. a feeling into or you know pain mm-hmm. into something beautiful Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. writing I think is probably the best habit that Mormonism actively instilled in me yeah because that was definitely like a a repeated message that I got and that was when I started journaling was like hearing it about it a lot of church being like okay I'll start a journal (laughs) so I'm grateful for that thanks Mormons thanks Mormons thanks mom (laughs) (laughs) Uh, you're like honestly my favorite type of person and I would definitely have you back on the channel I would love to before we say goodbye is that do you want to plug anything or where can people find you? The links are in the description box. I just, I do want everyone to look at Sam's Buffon. Check out the Buffon, because that's been huge for me. This is the most important work of my life. Yeah, and if I keep getting Buffons like that, I might not even be doing this anymore, <laughs> because... It'd just be me, solo, and Buffonless. <laughs> I can do a buffon on you. Do you want one? Oh, yeah. Okay, great. (laughs) Bye, suckers. (laughs) Yeah, you already said it. Stephanie Ann again. I named it that because I am known for all my hair stuff. Yeah, we haven't even mentioned this. Stephanie's like a very famous (laughs) hairstylist who became big in the sort of... Well, I feel like when Pinterest was getting big was when you really... Yeah, yeah. Like the beginning of social media. Like, Stephanie has half a million followers on Instagram for her hair stuff. And that's... She's even bigger on Pinterest. Do you guys know what this means? It's a monocle. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Have you seen this? I've seen the monocle. What's that about? It's like, I'm pretentious. fancy. Like, yeah. You want to be super fancy? <laughs> Pinky out monocle. <laughs> I've got half a million Gen Z heart. Still working on it, guys. Heart monocle. <laughs> I did the heart at Friendsgiving yesterday, and someone was like, that's the Gen Z heart. And I was like, yes, yes, yes it, it is. is. <laughs> Not that I'd notice. <laughs> All my generation's doing it. <laughs> been nice thanks yeah. for coming on no I've loved it just being yourself for a bit on camera yeah I can't think of anything else that I want to you know plug any other uh, little tidbits of wisdom yeah any or... little message like if you were dying tomorrow what would be kind of the message you'd oh, want to give oh dear just you know casually just a little stoic no pressure uh, <laughs> contemplation as much as I love words there's there's some things that you almost it's like I don't even it's like when you put it to words it like loses yeah. its you know what I mean yeah. That's why I always put it to dance. (laughs) Yes, exactly. (laughs) Yeah. I do love dancing. How come I've never seen you at ecstatic? I I was actually wondering if you were going to ecstatic dance. I walked into ecstatic dance for the first time and was like, oh, this is what I've been looking for my whole life. Okay, okay. So you've just recently started going? No, no, no. I I started going years ago and I just haven't been back in a while. COVID kind of got me off the thing. It's a little far for me. Sometimes I make it down, but that's what I would say. If you can't put it into words, then dance. Dance. The dance is to dance. Mm-hmm. All right. Thanks, y'all, for joining. Thank you guys. Yeah, thank Thanks you. Thanks for dancing along on this thing called life with yeah. us. <laughs> on this thing called chasing clout with us. <laughs> this thing called ethical and- clout chasing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let us know where you're at in your healing journey in the comments. I love reading, like, uh, you know, genuine, earnest, open-hearted comments about people's lives. So is that a cheesy thing to say? No, no, no. I think it's beautiful. Okay. Okay, love you love all. You. Bye. Thanks for joining us. Support us on Patreon if you want to read 80s Mormon fiction with us. Also, we completely rely on donations to keep the channel going, so there's ways you can do that in the description box. Also, you should buy our candle. It's really good, and it's the season for it. Tis the season. Mm-hmm. The reviews are raging, honestly. It's the best. They really are. Candle. They were so I nice. want to smell the candle. It's really yeah. good. Well, we can't afford to buy our own right now. But, <laughs> <laughs> but if we <laughs> keep getting donate. Patreon yeah. supporters, we will. <laughs> yeah. Okay, bye. love you, bye. Love you.